Hi, I'm Chris Mutchler, VCDX257 from virtualelephant.com, and welcome back to my Networking Fundamentals course. In this module, Module 2, we are going to discuss the fundamentals of TCP IP. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome to Module 2, The Fundamentals of TCP IP. We're going to spend a few minute, moments today discussing the TCP IP model and how it relates to the OSI model that we discussed in Module 1. Now, the important thing to remember here is that the TCP IP model is a practical implementation of a series of networking protocols. And just like the OSI model, it was established and created by a series of volunteers and is maintained in a number of RFCs. Now, the TCP IP model is an opportunity for us to be able to detail out the different protocols that are necessary to allow packets to transverse the internet from one point to another. And every system in the world today supports TCP IP. Everything from your laptop to your cell phone to even our refrigerators and other IoT devices. And again, it consolidates down from the seven layer OSI model to four layers, which you see here on the screen. And now these four layers are starting at the bottom, the network interface layer, the internetwork layer, the transport layer, and the application layer. Now it's important to remember that as we're discussing the TCP IP model today, you're going to hear me refer to things as L3 and L4. Again, these are references back to the OSI model, and this is just standard in networking terms today. Now, as we think of L3, the network layer in the OSI model, this is where IP operates, and that IP stands for Internet Protocol. An RFC 7090 defined the IP protocol, including a series of classes of networks that you see here on the table on the screen. Now, it's important to note that right now what we are referring to is IPv4. And in a few moments, we'll talk about what IPv4 is in more detail, as well as IPv6. Now, Layer 3 network addressing has allowed us as organizations and individuals to be able to logically group different addresses together. And one of the important things that we have to do in the networking space is develop, to develop an addressing scheme that we're going to use. And this can be different for every organization. And then as we come up with this addressing scheme, we're going to then split the different networks up so that we can leverage them across our organizations. The other important thing to remember here is that each IP address, something like 192.168.1.1, is split up into two separate parts. First, the network part, and then the host part. Now, as you look here on the, on the table on the screen, you can see that there are three main network classes that were defined in IPv4, and those are Class A, Class B, and Class C networks. And what we're referring to when we talk about these different network classes is really a breakdown of these logical groupings. And so you can see here in a class A address, the first octet ranges from 1 all the way to 126. Class B ranges from 128 to 191. And then a class 3 address typically goes from 192 to 223. And there are a series of valid network addresses and numbers within each one of those ranges that you can see here. In addition, the type of network class that is, it is is going to determine the number of hosts. And as you go from a class A network down to a class C network, you'll see typically that there are fewer addresses for hosts in a class C network as compared to a class A. Moving on more into this, and as we dive a little bit deeper into what we were just talking about here, for an IPv4 address, you can see on the screen here that what we're talking about is that those two parts are broken up into different bits. So for a class A network, okay, the network part of the address is contained in the first eight bits, and the host address is contained in the last 24 bits. Now you might be asking yourself, what are we talking about bits? Well, back when I learned IP addressing and subnetting, we actually had to learn how to write out these addresses in binary. So we're talking about the first eight bits of a binary sequence of numbers that are going to define an IP address. And so you can see that as we shift from a class A to a class B, the network 
portion of the address grows from 8 to 16, eventually to 24 with a class C network. Meanwhile, it's in reverse or the inverse for the host address. So it goes from 24 bits with a class A down to 16 and 8 with a class C. And you can also see that reflected in the default mask there on the table. So a typical network mask for a class A network is going to be 255.0.0.0. A class B address is going to have a default mask of 255.255.0.0. And finally, a class C address is going to be 255.255.255.0. Now, those last octets in each of those masks can be broken up even further and split down into different sizes. But again, these are the default boundaries when we talk about what has been predefined for us in the IP protocol. Now, the other thing to remember here or to keep in mind that you might hear someone refer to is you might hear somebody say that the network is a slash 24 or it's a slash 16 or even a slash 8. That slash 24, that slash 16, that number is referring back again to the number of bits that are contained in the network address. So you'll hear somebody say it's a slash 24. Now, when I hear slash 24, I immediately think a class C network. It means that I have 255 addresses in that network. And then as you go from a slash 24 moving down from a slash 24, for example, is 255. A slash 23 is then 512 and a slash 22 is 1,024 addresses that I have to use for my hosts. Now, as you go down from a slash 24, slash 23, slash 22 on downward, basically you just start doubling the number of host addresses that you have available to you. Now, some other things that you should keep in mind when we talk about IP, okay, and IPv6 specifically now. IPv6 has no concept of these predefined classes or fixed addresses, address ranges. Okay, instead, it's going to rely entirely on a flexible and hierarchical address scheme. And the way that it does this is that it's basically allocated out so many bits for network addressing that it's so, the, the number is so great that it's almost unfathomable that an individual organization would consume all of the IP addresses. Now, when we talk about IPv6, there are five things to keep in mind. There are things called a global unicast address, a link local address, a unique local address, an anycast address, and a multicast address. Now, anycast addresses and multicast addresses pretty much operate the exact same way as they do in an IPv4 network. Okay, now that's important to remember, okay? So then the other thing too is those top three, global unicast addresses. Okay, now these are going to be globally unique and every one of these are routable across the internet. And then every IPv6 address that gets assigned to a network interface also gets a link local address. And this link local address is used for communication between devices on the local network segment. And these are not routable. And then finally, we have unique local addresses. And these are similar to what a private IPv4 address is um, out in the, in the standard. And we didn't really talk about that yet. But a private space um, in a class A network is going to be 10.0.0.0 slash 8. A private IP address in the class B network scheme is 172.16.0.0 slash 16. And then the private network space that we're probably most familiar with because whenever you stand up like a Wi-Fi router at home or a cable modem at home, you'll see more than likely it used the 192.168.0.0 slash uh, 24 address space, okay? And so those are private IP spaces that have been predefined in the IPv4 definition that are not routable across the internet. Now, as we move on from IP and we go from L3 up to L4 in the OSI model, now we're moving into the network layer of the OSI model. So in L4 protocol, there are two, which we mentioned before, TCP and UDP. Now, first we're gonna talk about UDP. And UDP stands for User Datagram Protocol. Okay, now the important thing to remember and that I hinted back in module one is that UDP is a connectionless 
uh, protocol, and it provides no reliability across the across the L4 transport layer. Now, what does that mean? Well, what it means is that the two the two devices that are communicating across the network, the client and the server, when the server sends data to the client or vice versa across UDP, there's no handshake being taken place, and there's no acknowledgement that, hey, my packet that I sent to you, you received it. That's what sets the part UDP from TCP. And we'll talk more about that handshake, that TCP handshake in a few moments. Now, some of the uh, use cases for UDP, things like messaging services. So think of like uh, AMQP, RabbitMQ, Kafka, and other messaging services, things that are throwing out lots of data across the network that you just want to throw into a queue and then you're going to do something, process it at a later time. And you're hoping it gets there, but if it doesn't, it's not the end of the world. The UDP protocol or interface that we're probably most common, uh, that we interact with most commonly that we maybe don't even know about are DNS requests. DNS requests are typically across the UDP protocol because if I don't get a response back, I just send it again and I'm not worried about the overhead or even necessarily the time that it takes for me to get a response for a DNS request. Now, some of the things to keep in mind that UDP, UDP does include. It does include functions such as data transfer. It can provide, uh, perform segmentation. So if the packets are too large, it can break them up. And it also does multiplexing of port numbers. And these are also functions that exist in TCP. Now, again, by it being connectionless, it naturally means that a UDP protocol has lower overhead and is able to reduce the amount of processing that takes place because again it's not performing this TCP handshake and acknowledgement that the packets are indeed receiving are are indeed being received at the other end and so that's what makes UDP so great for things like messaging queues some of the advantages that it does have over TCP is that by not using the sequence and acknowledgement fields within the UDP uh, header, it's able to process the data quickly. And you can see here uh, the four uh, fields that are contained within the UDP header, a source port, a destination port, a length, and a checksum value. And each one of those is only two bytes long. Now TCP. Okay, so TCP is really the core of all of the layer four OSI protocols. And it provides reliable and error-free communication between devices over a network. Here in the table, you can see the predominantly long list of features that TCP provides. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of these, but a few of them I do want to talk about. So that second one there that you see in the table, reliable data transfer. So again, we've been talking about this TCP uh, handshake that takes place. And this is happening in part because we want to make sure that we have a means by which we can have reliable da uh, data transfer. And so what it does is that every packet that's sent across the network that's encapsulated in TCP, we're going to make sure that it arrives intact and that it's arriving in the correct order. And we do this by leveraging sequence numbers and acknowledgements in the packet itself. Now, in addition to that, one of the things that TCP does as well is it does connection termination meaning that when my session is over, I'm going to actually terminate the connection. Now, again, if we're thinking about this as a conversation between two people, which is really what a network session is between a client and a server, okay, we're having a conversation. When you're on the telephone and you're talking to a friend or a colleague, when you're finished with the phone call, you say something along the lines of, I'll talk to you later, goodbye, see you soon, what have you. That's an acknowledgement between the two individuals that, hey, we're actually ending this conversation. The TCP protocol does that as well through connection termination. Now, the other thing that I want to highlight here is the full duplex communication. Back in the day, we used to have to make sure that our network interfaces were operating at full duplex or half duplex because we would see poor performance across the network when our devices were only configured in half duplex. Now, this is probably something we don't have to worry about now in 2024, but it is something that you should be aware of. And what full, full duplex communication means is that TCP supports simultaneous data exchanges in both directions, 
using separate transmit and receive buffers. So basically we're able to throw out more data across the network and then be able to speed up our communication between two devices. Now in comparison to the rather simplistic UDP header that I showed you a few moments ago, here is a graphic that shows the, the TCP header. And you can see that there's a lot more data contained in it. Now again, source, port, destination port exist, but now you see a sequence number and an acknowledgement number. Now those are going to be incremented as each packet traverses the internet is sent from the client to the server and the server back to the client. And this is a way to make sure that again, we have that reliable data transmission occurring. And then we're gonna see a lot of other things, including a checksum value, and then additional options that we wanna include maybe in that TCP uh, encapsulated packet. Now, as we look and uh, look to compare TCP and UDP, you can see that we really have five categories that we're most concerned with. Ordered data transfer, multiplexing using ports, reliable transfer, flow control, and connections. And then here in the table, you can see what TCP does for all five of those and what UDP does only for a few of them. And you can see explicitly that things like reliable transfer and flow control are not actually a feature within the UDP protocol. So we want to keep these things in mind as we talk about applications later on and, and debugging and troubleshooting uh, different network traffic types. We want to understand what the core difference is between UDP is and TCP so that when we're using a, a program like TCP dump or we're tracing packets across the network, we know what we're looking at. We know that we should be looking for things like the sequence number, things like the acknowledgement number when we're, when we're troubleshooting TCP issues. Now, the last thing that I want to cover here in the TCP IP fundamentals module is this TCP handshake that we've alluded to earlier on. Now, again, the TCP handshake is part of that data, that reliable data function that we have in the TCP protocol. And it's a three-step process that's going to be able to establish that reliable communication between two devices over a network. And it's a fundamental part of the TCP protocol. And again, it's going to ensure that data reliability and integrity of the data between the communication of two devices. So the first thing that happens is a SYN is sent. And now this SYN, the client sends a TCP segment with the SYN or synchronized flag set to the server. And then when the server receives, okay, that SYN packet, upon receiving it, the server is going to now respond back to the client with what's called a SYN ACK. And again, this is going to be a SYN and an ACK flag that is set in that TCP header. And now once that SYN ACK is sent from the server back to the client, the final thing that's going to happen is that the client, upon receiving that SYN ACK, is now going to as, uh, send an ACK packet back to the, the server to acknowledge, ACK acknowledge, that it received it. And so at this point, the client and the server have established to one another that, hey, I'm able to communicate to you and I have an open channel for communication. And now when you troubleshoot things like this and you're having issues on your network, oftentimes the first thing that you're going to want to look at when you're doing something like you see pings being dropped between a device, between two devices, you're like, why is my ping not happening? And then you do a trace route to see where in the route path is the packet being dropped. And then once you have that, you'll, you'll create or you'll start a TCP dump to be able to track the packets between those two devices where it seems to be failing and the first thing you want to look for is this TCP handshake. So being able to understand how this TCP handshake is going to be crucial as we talk more about packets and troubleshooting steps later on in the Networking Fundamentals course. Thank you for joining me in Module 2, the TCP IP model and the fundamentals of TCP IP. Please join me in Module 3 where we discuss packets and I walk you through how a packet traverses the network. If you're enjoying this content and want to learn more about networking fundamentals, make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel and turn on notifications so that you get notified with each module as it's released. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks.